Welcome everyone to our live healthy living event, Robotic Knee Replacement. If you've been walking around in pain, avoiding golfing or gardening, we have great news. With help of the Rosa Robot, orthopedic surgeon Dr. Paul Telehowski can get your knee replaced with amazing fit, comfort, and recovery. He's going to explain today to you and any other surgeons watching how the innovative robotic technology is helping people get back to their lives finally pain-free. The best part is Dr. Telehowski is going to answer your questions live. So go ahead and text me, text, don't call, 248-935-2562 or post your questions on Facebook or YouTube. Now, Dr. Telehowski is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon with more than 20 years experience with expertise in joint replacement, trauma, and sports medicine. You can meet with him at the Ortho Michigan office in Flint. He's using the Rosa Robot at Hurley Center for Joint Replacement, which is one of the leading joint replacement programs in the country and only one of two Project Joints exemplar hospitals in the state. Dr. Telehowski? To give a little overview of the presentation today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly arthritis is. Um, we're going to talk about some of the more conservative treatment options related to treating arthritis. Uh, later on in the talk, we'll get into some of the surgical options that are available in treating patients that have unrelenting hip and knee pain. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the surgery itself, a little bit about what goes on before and after the surgery, some of the recovery involved. There'll be time at the end for, obviously, questions and answers. And uh, during the portion regarding knee replacement, I will talk a little bit about our newest technology, the uh, ROSA knee replacement. Starting off uh, with arthritis, arthritis is one of the most debilitating diseases we see throughout the entire population. Over 30 million adults are affected by it. It really occurs when the cushion or cartilage within the joint wears out. Uh, it leads to pain, stiffness, and swelling within the joint. I think there's a big misunderstanding out there. A lot of people assume arthritis is something that grows in them, but I tell my patients, in fact, it's really not that. It's really more of a lack of the cartilage or a wearing out, somewhat like happens to the tires on your car after many, many miles. Some of the risk factors for developing arthritis can include injury, overuse, sometimes age, uh, gender, obesity or weight, and our genetics. There's different forms of arthritis, the most common being osteoarthritis, the simple wear and tear form. There's also some inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis that can affect multiple joints at once. Arthritis also can occur in any joint in the body. We see it commonly in the weight-bearing joints, the hip and knee, although some patients have shoulder, elbow, and ankle arthritis. When patients come see me, most of their symptoms involve pain. Um, some will report either stiff or swollen joints. They report symptoms to usually increase after activity or during activity. They'll report sometimes weakness in their legs or giving way. This is especially common when patients have bad knee arthritis. Many patients will report problems with their gait. During our exam, what we will see is usually a limited range of motion of the involved joint, grinding within the joint, or signs of injury to the tendons and ligaments that involve that joint. We will commonly take x-rays in our office. This is one of the most accurate tests we have for detecting arthritis. Occasionally, we may order MRIs to get a better look at some of the structures inside of the knees. Some patients may also be required to get blood testing if there's a concern, for example, for rheumatoid arthritis. Here's a couple uh, pictures uh, representing uh, these conditions. On the uh, left side, on the top, is more of an artist re rendering of what we see with hip arthritis, where on the far left in the upper corner, there's a normal hip and next to that, a right hip, more diseased hip where the cartilage has worn. These are seen below that with x-ray uh, uh, pictures showing what, on the far right a normal looking hip joint and right next to it a diseased hip joint where the cartilage has been worn away and the patient has the classic presentation of the bone on bone problem. Similarly, on the right side is a schematic of a knee showing a more normal looking healthy knee and then an artist's rendition of the more worn cartilage and likewise, then underneath those, the more normal appearing x-ray with good space between the bones. And then on the far right, a pattern of bone-on-bone -bone arthritis that is so commonly seen in patients. So early treatment in, in arthritis typically involves non-surgical treatment. We will almost always recommend an increase in people's physical activity to their tolerance. We encourage them uh, to maintain a walking program, perhaps a stationary biking program, pool therapy, things that are more low impact 
and tolerable to the joint that is starting to wear out. This helps keep their muscle strength and their range of motion. We can also add physical therapy in some cases to, to add to this. Some patients' weight loss can play a big role in relieving some of their knee pain. These are weight-bearing joints, and obviously heavier patients uh, may experience more weight in their knees and hips when they start to wear out. And so weight loss becomes a, a, a crucial factor in some patients in helping to control their symptoms. We can always add medications. Most patients, by the time they see me, have been on some of these, whether they be over-the-counter, Tylenol, Motrin-type medications. We have prescription medications. We can sometimes try steroid, and sometimes disease-modifying agents can be utilized in patients that have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. That's commonly done with the aid of our rheumatology colleagues. In our practice, uh, we do perform quite a few injections for patients. This helps them control their pain, allows them to be more active. We will either use steroid injections or sometimes a product we call viscosupplementation. A common term out there is called the chicken shots. Uh, these are kind of like a gel or a lubricant shot that are put into people's knees. Um, these can provide patients with good pain relief, allow them to stay functional. Uh, they are repeatable sometimes over time. And so uh, managing people in this respect uh, can go a long way at keeping them active. There are, however, times where those treatments don't always solve the problem for patients. Some patients may continue to complain of loss of function or pain. And in those times, uh, surgery may be indicated for those patients. To get in a little bit of the new technology we're using over here at uh, Hurley, this is kind of the exciting part of, I think, this talk. Um, this is a device I'm using in the operating room. It's a kind of a two-part device. The one part is the uh, robotic arm. The other part is kind of the camera that lets us see the knee in space. With this, uh, with this new system here, we're able to take very detailed calculated measurements of the patient's anatomy in the operating room. Uh, with those measurements, we're able to, in a way, customize how the implant goes in so that it fits right, it's sized right, um, and so that ultimately what we feel is that uh, when the patient recovers, the knee feels right. Uh, we have known for a long time that uh, patients tend to be more satisfied with their knee when it's placed appropriately, when it's sized right, uh, therefore it works correctly. And uh, when those things are met, patients tend to have a very high satisfaction uh, with their knee replacement. Uh, sometimes in our office we will obtain a uh, little more detailed x-rays. We can sometimes use this in planning of the procedure itself. Um, it, it, this is not necessarily needed in every case, but it, it, on certain times we will, we will extend this and, and obtain some uh, long leg uh, standing films in the office uh, if, we, if we feel they're uh, needed. Uh, in the operating room, we're using some ca these cameras and trackers uh, so that, again, we can take some detailed uh, images of the knee and then use that information to dial in the knee replacement. Um, and I kind of tell people it is, somewhat, it is somewhat equivalent to like what a carpenter does, the old saying, measure, measure twice, cut once. And uh, this system is really allowing us to be much more accurate and precise uh, when placing these in, in patients. Uh, so I think it's very exciting technology. Uh, the robot arm, uh, I always tell my patients, it does not do surgery. I'm still doing surgery. Um, but it does allow us to position these guides on the knees, uh, which allow us to resect bone at much more precise uh, and measured calculations. And so the, the robot, um, although we call it that, I kind of call it a measuring device uh, and, a, and a surgical instrument that we're using within the operating room. Um, so it's, it's pretty high tech, pretty, pretty uh, nice, nice instrumentation, but again, allowing us much more detail in, in the work we're doing. So I always get asked, is a knee replacement right for me? Uh, this is a common question patients uh, ask me when they come in. My answer to them in most instances is that if their pain is severe enough that it's limiting their activities every day, they're finding that they're not able to perform activities they enjoy or want to do, and they're living with pain uh, both with rest and activity, it may very well be time to think about knee replacement. And certainly this is a, this is a point that a lot of patients get to, and the decision is then made to proceed forward with uh, potentially a knee replacement. After we do a knee replacement, the good news is, is we're allowed, we can tell our patients that yes, they will be able to do walking, golfing, swimming, uh, activities that they enjoy, including hiking and even some patients' low-impact sports, golfing, maybe doubles tennis. We have a lot of patients that can get back to that stuff. Uh, that's quite rewarding to see after patients have a knee replacement. A lot of patients have given up those activities, and then after they get this procedure done, they're able to get back at those things that they enjoy. 
most patients who have a knee replacement perhaps won't get back to running or jogging, but in most instances, since patients have given that up for a while now because of their bad knee, we don't typically see patients necessarily wanting to get back at that. And usually the high impact sports are a little bit discouraged after knee replacement just because we don't want excessive damage to occur to the replacement. Uh, going on a little bit further, I also do hip replacements. Patients ask me, is it right, is it right for them? When is the right time? Uh, hip Hip arthritis certainly, just like knee arthritis, affects people's activities, uh, continuous pain, night pain, it wakes them up at night. Uh, and so patients, once they get to this point, hip replacements can be an extremely successful procedure. Um, I really enjoy doing hip replacements for patients in addition to knees because we see with hip replacements, patients tend to recover quickly, they tend to get back up moving, they report excellent pain relief, usually very quickly after the surgery. Um, and they're quite pleased with it very quickly on. Hip replacements don't particularly, in general, require as much physical therapy after the surgery as maybe a knee replacement does. Uh, and so patients who undergo these that have very bad hips seem to respond very, very well to them. Um, and they're quite pleased with it very quickly on. Hip replacements don't particularly, in general, require as much physical therapy after the surgery as maybe a knee replacement does. Uh, and so patients who undergo these that have very bad hips seem to respond very, very well to them. When patients are set up for a joint replacement through my office, uh, there's some very simple things that may be done ahead of time. They may include a little bit of blood tests, review of medications. We do ask our patients to have any dental procedures done uh, before their joint replacement. We don't want any type of dental work for about three months being done after a, a, a replacement as it's a risk for possible infection. There may be a little bit of home planning needed. For example, if a patient has an upstairs bedroom, they may need a week or two of, of moving themselves downstairs. It's not that patients can't climb stairs right after surgery. They certainly can, but sometimes a, a small change around the house can make the recovery slightly easier. We at our office have a dedicated joint replacement class that we ask our patients to attend. My patients will meet with our therapist through Ortho Michigan one time before the surgery happens. Uh, our therapist will go through the entire program start to finish. They do usually a home evaluation for patients where they will get any equipment that may be needed uh, to just make the environment slightly safer for those first couple weeks after the surgery. Some of those things might include a raised toilet seat, a shower chair. Most patients don't need a lot of equipment, but a small little things for the first couple weeks can make things go much smoother for patients. The day of the procedure, we bring patients in in the morning. Uh, our anesthesiology colleagues will see the patients. We do provide for knee replacements a, uh, a block before the surgery. Patients will get a small injection in their inner thigh uh, done under ultrasound guidance. This is very successful at relieving some of the immediate post-operative symptoms as it numbs the knee up very well. During surgery, once I put the knee replacement in, my patients will get injections into the knee before we close the incision. The, between this and the block, most patients have very, ex very good pain relief for at least the first 20 24 hours after their knee replacement. It's a nice thing because as soon as we're done with the surgery, patients will spend about two hours in the recovery room waking up from their anesthesia. But because their knee is fairly numb, they're able to go upstairs to our joint replacement floor. We get them up, we get them walking, we get them moving. And so my patients, I will tell them two to three hours after the surgery, they will be walking on their new knee or their new hip. So we do like to get patients moving very quickly after the surgery. We have a few medications that they'll be put on. Uh, we don't use anything real strong. We want our patients awake, alert, being able to tolerate therapy. They can eat after the, the surgery. Most, uh, most patients will work on stairs because patients have those at home. We need them to be able to accomplish that to go home. And the vast majority of patients pass therapy uh, post-operative day one and are able to go home. In my office then, the follow-ups are usually at a two-week, six-week, and three-month mark. So there's only, there's only about three visits after the surgery. The big portion of the recovery after knee replacement, uh, patients will be required to usually attend physical therapy. Um, it's mostly a three time a week program, uh, day on, day off, uh, where they're working with therapy, helping to move their knee. We are the only hospital in this area utilizing the ROSA system. Uh, it's been wonderful technology. Uh, my patients that have been through it now, I think we're seeing nice recoveries from these. I think by putting it in patients, we can get it to fit better. We can get it to fit uh, the knee better. With that fit being better, I think overall patients feel better with the knee replacement. And in the end, the beautiful thing about it is I think patients recover their function very well. Um, and that's what we've always been after when doing knee replacements is to get a good fit so that it feels right to the patient, 
so that ultimately their function is excellent. I cannot thank Hurley enough for putting the program together for us and obtaining the technology to be able to use this. So I really encourage patients to come in, sit down and talk about this as an option. Uh, we really have found it to be of great success. Victory, my victory dance. And if you'd like to ask Dr. Telehowski something, you can text your question to 248-935-2562 or post on Facebook or YouTube. Christina says that she uh, had her left knee had two scopes. There's still a lot of crunching, stiffness, and pain. Um, Scott's saying that he's had steroid injections in both of his knees for several years. And they're both asking, like, at what point do you decide, hey, this is the time. It's, it's time for a knee replacement. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and probably one of the harder ones to answer um, specifically. For a lot of patients, it has a lot to do not only with their symptoms, their pain, uh, but a lot to do with their function. Uh, I see a lot of patients committing to getting their knee replaced when they really find that life is getting difficult when they're finding that perhaps the treatments from the office, the injections, the therapy, the bracing isn't particularly working well. Uh, they combine that sometimes with the discussion of the loss of function, the inability to perhaps enjoy things in life. Uh, playing golf, for example, or going to the grocery store become a struggle. And for a lot of these patients, that becomes a lot of times a tipping point to make the decision to uh, commit to getting their knee fixed. And for a lot of patients, that's a good call because then uh, after we do that and they have their knee fixed, they, they really find the ability to get back to that th those activities. Um, so I, I tend to see that a lot in my office. Uh, patients have gone through these more what we would call conservative non-surgical treatments. Uh, and then get to the point where their function has declined to where they're really seeking a, a more permanent solution uh, to their problem. Um, Amy wants to know the difference in rehabilitation and time and the process um, when you're using the robot. Yeah, so here at Hurley we've been using the, the Rosa robot now for several years and I, I think what I've seen, uh, given the fact that we can align this knee so well now and get it to fit so well, I think it does help in the recovery. I think a well-aligned, well-fit knee allows patients to recover a little bit quicker. Uh, they seem to be able to move their knee easier, function a little better early on. Um, so I, I, I think there is a point to that of uh, using this technology to give people a better fitting knee, a better aligned knee. I think there is some translation into recovery. Um, I'm not going to hide it. I think pe people still have to go through a recovery period with knee replacement. It's still going to take them a month, two months to go through things. Uh, to get through therapy and get their strength back. But certainly in the earlier phases, uh, I see patients sort of progressing through that perhaps a little bit easier than we did in the past. Uh, and it's one of the nice benefits I think I've seen from using the, the newer ROSA technology uh, with, with the knee replacements. Um, Hazel asked how long we've been doing the knee uh, surgery with Rosa and it's been three years. I know in your uh, presentation, you know, you had talked a little bit about, just so people understand that the robot isn't doing the surgery, you are, and you have plenty of experience in this. Yeah, absolutely correct, and that's a, it's a, it's a very good point you bring up, and a, a question I get asked a lot in my office when people bring this up and I start talking about it. I'm very clear with folks, although we call it a robot in the operating room, it does have somewhat of a robotic arm that helps us out in surgery, it helps position some guides, but in reality what the robot is, is it's a, it's a very accurate measuring tool. Um, it, it's an, uh, more of an optical system. We can put some markers on the actual bones that the robot can see and then when moving the leg around, taking measurements, we can plan out the surgery on the computer screen before actually making cuts and decisions on the bone itself. And so um, it is not really a robot that does surgery. I always kind of laugh about that with my patients. Um, just like a pilot flying an airplane, uh, they can put it on autopilot, but the pilot's flying the plane. And this robot doesn't do surgery. It has no cutting tools or anything like that on the robot itself. Uh, it's very simply a very accurate measuring device that helps position a few of the instruments during the surgery. But the actual 
actual surgery itself I'm doing. Uh, so I'm using it more as a, as a fancy tool, much like the way a carpenter would use a very fancy tool in their trade. We're using this to help with very precise alignment and, and adding precision to the, to the surgery. That robot can measure distances and measurements that our eyes can't really see. Uh, and so it gives us very fine feedback in the operating room that we can really fine tune and adjust. And when we're done with the surgery, it gives us the ability to double check those measurements uh, to make sure that we've, we've hit the targeted plan uh, at the end of the surgery. So when the patient's leaving the operating room, we're confident about how we put this knee in and how well aligned it really is. And I think that's translating into results, much like the last question we, we addressed. With patients having this well-aligned knee, it just seems like their function and their, their quality of their, of their recovery seems to benefit from that. Um, so we've been very excited about using it over the past couple years, and it's, it's really become, uh, in a way, starting to become a standard for how these knees are now being done. Um, we have a question about BMI and what BMI do you require to get the surgery done? Yeah, BMI has always been a bit of a tricky issue. The BMI is the body mass index, and that's a, that's a ratio of patients' height and weight. Uh, certainly taller people tend to be a little bit heavier than shorter people, but uh, this ratio gives us a better idea of really where they're at. There's a lot of science over the last 10 years that does point to the fact that increased BMIs do relate to increased risks of complications related to any surgery. And it's very true in knee and hip replacement surgeries. And so we as orthopedic surgeons take that very carefully. We want our patients to do well. We don't want to blindly put people through surgery to only see them have a complication or a, or a problem. And BMI is only one of those factors. It's a common one, unfortunately, that we see, but it's not much different than smoking or diabetes or heart disease. Some of these factors we can correct before the surgery app actually takes place. And it helps to minimize the risk that the patient is exposed to. I always use the example uh, when patients perhaps have an elevated BMI coming to see me. I said, you wouldn't want your pilot taking off in the plane if the warning lights, what lights were blinking in the cockpit. And a surgeon should be somewhat the same way. Our science shows us that this, this is an issue related to complications. And so I think it's smart to sit down and talk with patients and explain. We would like to help them, but we also want to do it very safely. And so if weight loss can be done before surgery to help get BMI down, that translates into the potential for much less complications, better outcomes, and, and patients can do just better. Um, so I think it is important. It can be a little bit of a hard situation. I understand that. It's sometimes a, a, a somewhat difficult discussion to have with patients. But in the end, we have this talk because we want our patients to do well and, 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 and have good results. We don't ever want to put a patient through surgery to, to look back on it and go, boy, if we had just had that patient lose a little bit of weight, we probably wouldn't be into this situation. So I think when it's explained to a lot of patients, they, they understand that issue. Um, and it it's, it's really translates into safety uh, in the end. Um, what kind of anesthetic is used? Yeah, so uh, one of the nice things we've been doing here, especially at Hurley, uh, over about the last well, couple years, if not longer, um, patients, all patients get a block before the surgery, uh, and that involves the anesthesiologist 10 minutes before the case. Uh, in the preoperative area, patients get usually two injections, one in the inner thigh, one right behind the knee. It's usually done with a little bit of sedation so patients are comfortable. Uh, they use the ultrasound to kind of localize a couple of the nerves that give us sensation around the knee and they can inject around them. And it helps numb them up. I tell people it's very equivalent to like when you go to the dentist and they numb your jaw up so they can do work on your teeth. Um, Currently, our anesthesiologists are also putting in a pain pump catheter, which has been a really nice thing over the last, we've only been using it now for the last several months, but it's giving patients a good at least three days worth of really good pain relief. They can go home with the catheter in place. It simply pulls out on day three, very simple, uh, but it's really providing wonderful pain relief. Patients go into the operating room, they're still asleep for the surgery, um, so they're getting usually a general anesthetic. And then we are additionally adding medications into their knee. After we put the knee replacement in, before we close up the incision, we will add some medications into the knee to provide some additional numbing. So when patients wake up in the recovery room from the general anesthesia, we see them with their legs fairly well numbed up. They're able to move them, bend them, 
but they really can't feel them. I tell, again, I tell people much like when you go to the dentist and your, your jaw is numbed up from the, from the procedure. Um, these blocks are lasting a good 48, 72 hours. It allows patients a couple hours after the surgery to get up, get walking, get moving. We have therapy work with them usually. Um, and a lot of patients can go home that same day. We're not really finding many patients needing to spend the night in the hospital anymore because they really don't have a ton of discomfort. And as a result, they can get up, get moving, get home. When they get home, they're able to move around their own, their own house, um, get into you know the bathroom, the bedroom. Um, yes, we don't hide it after about day three, that pain pump catheter comes out. Yes, the knee is swollen. Yes, it, it does start to hurt. There's usually some pain medication involved. But by then, patients have been home moving around and they realize they can do all this. And sometimes I remind my patients, their knee hurt before the surgery was done in addition, and they were still doing all this stuff on a bad knee. So a lot of patients find that uh, the, the recovery period there um, is not as bad maybe as they think it was going to be, especially if they compare perhaps if they had a parent 15 years ago get a knee replacement. I think what they're seeing now is this marked uh, decrease in the symptoms patients have, their ability and their function. Um, so there's been a lot of improvements. That's one of, been one of the big um, one of the big uh, advantages we've seen over the last several years with some of our anesthetic techniques and such in allowing patients to get up, get moving. I, I tell patients now, and it can be surprising sometimes to have the discussion, that over 75% of my knee replacements are now done as outpatient surgeries. Um, and, and so when patients hear that, they're quite surprised at that, and it's kind of a nice thing uh, that patients don't have to spend time in the hospital now. Can you do knee and hip replacement if they're on the same side at the same time? Um, it is not advised. I think uh, when patients ask me that about combination surgeries, um, I, I'm very much tell them you are not an automobile. You have a limited supply of blood. There's a limited supply of pain people can tolerate, trauma that the body can tolerate. So no, we don't usually combine procedures. Uh, knee replacement or a hip replacement is big enough surgery on one day. Uh, in the old days, they used to do simultaneous knee replacements. In fact, when I first started, we occasionally did that. But as more science came out, we kind of learned that that's probably not safe for the patient. We were seeing very high complication rates when those were done. And so a lot of surgeons moved away about 15 years ago from doing combination surgeries like that. And it was really just based on science and studies showing us that patients were just having higher complication rates. Um, so we would rather space them out, even when I have a hip and a knee on the same patient. We perhaps would do one joint uh, first, maybe get them through it maybe three to four months down the road. I have a lot of patients like that who have two bad knees, they get one knee done. When I see them back on the three-month visit and follow-up, they're doing well with their first knee. It's not unusual to schedule them for their second knee on that visit. Uh, it does happen that way quite frequently. And it's a lot safer to do it that way. What about high impact sports? Could you ever return to a sport like hockey after knee replacement? Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I have a lot of, I, I call it men, men do, I have a lot of guys that come in that play beer league hockey. They've played hockey their whole life and they want to continue it. And part of the reason they're in seeing me is because their knee has been a problem and they're struggling with it. Um, I tell those patients that ice skating in and of itself, you know, the, the risk of being on the ice is falling, and certainly you have a knee replacement. And, you know, there, there can be times where if people fall on a knee replacement, they can do injury to it. Uh, they can break the bone or, you know, whatever, knock it loose. Now, with that being said, I have plenty of, of, of people that have been ice skating their whole life. Yes, they get back on their skates. They are able to do it. I won't hide it from them. I will tell them there perhaps might be a slight inherent risk to the activity they're doing. Uh, but I think if they They've been doing it, they're good at it, they're not trying to learn it for the first time. I think it's acceptable. I, I think it's okay. I, I tell my downhill snow skiers and my you know, athletes such as that uh, who like to get back at that stuff that it probably is okay within reason. I think you have to always use some common sense. Craig says he's had a bunch of knee operations. Is it harder for replacement on a knee with a staple in it? 
Uh, sometimes those, those old hardware, we, we do see those patients. I have patients that have had previous ACL reconstructions. They might have small screws in the bone from that or previous staples. Those usually are not a big issue. Uh, they, they may have to come out during the time of surgery. That is usually not a big issue uh, with these. Um, if patients perhaps have larger like rods or screws from perhaps an accident they had at a younger age, sometimes we'll stage those procedures. If we know taking out the hardware itself, is going to be a big procedure. We might do that ahead of time, uh, perhaps a month or two ahead of time, and then do a second surgery to replace the knee. Um, but a lot of times if patients have had more sports surgeries like, like ACL reconstruction, uh, they have small screws or staples, and those can a lot of times come out during the knee replacement itself. Um, so, you know, I have a couple of questions about bone on bone and no cartilage and if you can still use the robot. Is there certain conditions where you would or wouldn't use the robot or? Uh, in reality, no. The, the robot can be used pretty much in any of these situations. The robot is designed for conventional knee replacement. Most patients getting a knee replacement are bone on bone. That's why they're having it done. Um, uh, I see patients because of their arthritis have developed uh, somewhat of angular deformities in their knee. They're either fairly knock-kneed or bow-legged and this is where the robot actually plays a big role because it's helping us get these limbs straight in the operating room. Uh, like I said, because it can measure so well, one to two degrees our eye can't really pick up, but the robot can see it. And so when we take these x-rays in the office after patients have had these knees done, their legs are nice and straight. Um, so the robot plays a big role in those situations. That's where it really has benefited us because those were the patients in the past that perhaps surgeries were done, yeah, maybe we tried to hit the target, uh, weren't, we weren't quite getting as close as we wanted to. But now with this, before we can leave the operating room, we know these legs are well aligned and the knees are well fit. Um, so um, the, the, the robotic technology, the Rosa robotic technology we're using today uh, certainly fits all of these patients. Um, I have yet to run into somebody that we don't use it on, um, so it's, it's been very successful. Um, this person had a knee replacement 20 years ago. It's not good any longer. They want to know if they can get another knee replacement on the same leg. The answer to that is uh, pending looking at it and evaluating, most likely yes. We, we do see patients who had knees done back in the 1990s and uh, they're still around with us and, and sometimes those knees from back then do wear out. The technology wasn't quite as good back then. They worked well and they served their purpose, but we know after about 20 years on those older knees, they can wear, they can start to cause problems. Um, based on x-rays and everything, we can make decisions on that, but most knees that have failed over time can be revised. We don't really run into issues related to that. Patients still have to be healthy uh, to undergo the surgery. I think that tends to be the biggest roadblock. Unfortunately, we might see patients who, if, if they perhaps are getting into their later 80s, early 90s, they had a knee done when they were in their 70s, it can be sometimes challenging to talk to sometimes a bit older patient about a larger surgery to revise their knee. But in most instances, we are able to, to successfully revise knee replacements and give them a new stable knee, something that feels good and functions well. Um, we are in the business of doing that because we have these patients that had knees done 20 years ago, um, so they, they need help. Um, I'm happy to say the new knees we're putting in probably are better, and, and the fact that they are better aligned with better technology makes us think that these knees should last a lot longer. Um, that's been also, a, 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 so far, an unproven benefit of the robot, but that is certainly what we're thinking uh, with the newer technology. Daniel wants to know if there's a risk to older patients, like 85 and up. After the age of 80, there may be a slight increased risk in surgery, regardless of what the surgery is, based on age alone. It really has, though, more to do with health status. Uh, during my career, I've done plenty of knee replacements, hip replacements in patients who are over the age of 80 uh, with great success. Um, but most of these patients, they do have to be fairly healthy. Uh, the more medical issues there are, uh, they need, those medical issues need to be evaluated by either cardiology, pulmonology, medical doctors to make sure that the patient is safe to have surgery. Um, and so there has, sometimes there has to be a little bit of a group effort or team effort in getting patients to the point where we can get them into the operating room to get them fixed. Um, there are some patients, maybe if they have enough serious medical problems, they may be advised by their cardiologist or such to perhaps avoid surgery. 
Um, anesthesiologists have to feel comfortable putting patients to sleep, and, and, and so the cardiologist and them have to be on, tr on board with performing these procedures. Um, so the, there's, a, there's a few variables there that come into play uh, when deciding upon this. But age itself, it, a lot of times, is not, is not the biggest uh, roadblock to getting patients fixed. Is there a difference in the different knee manufacturers? That's a good question. Uh, I, I tend to use one specific manufacturer. They make the Rosa Robot. That's Depu. That's it's Biomet uh, Zimmer. Uh, there's there's a couple other companies out there that make products. I think all knee replacements in general are very good. They're all cleared by the FDA to be used, and there's a lot of surgeons that use them. Um, and it's funny because I see patients who have a different type, a different brand. No one particularly knows the difference. It's it, you'll never particularly feel like you have one knee versus another knee. Uh, they all tend to work well. They've all been proven that way. Um, so I think it ultimately becomes the surgeon, what the surgeon gets comfortable with, um, how they go in, how they fit, uh, the technology involved in putting certain ones in. Um, there are certainly other surgeons out there that use other brands that get very good results. Um, I don't think a lot of us really argue about that at meetings we go to when we talk about which one we use or why we use it. Um, I think we're all pretty happy with what we're comfortable using. Um, in the last question, uh, this person says they have a worn out meniscus and osteoarthritis. Are there non-invasive procedures or other options? Well, yeah, that goes back to maybe where we started here. Certainly in a, in a lot of cases, we start in the office setting with things like therapy, injections, bracing, um, strengthening exercises. For a lot of patients, those can be successful. Um, they can help patients continue to leave an, lead an active lifestyle. Um, and certainly before most of my patients ever get to a surgery point, we like to at least have seen that we've tried this stuff for them. I always say if I can get patients better with a simple injection or perhaps some, some medication and not have to do surgery on them, that's a good thing. Um, I, I get that patients don't come into the, my office wanting to have surgery. Surgery becomes the option when everything else has failed. Um, and at that point, yes, we do have a discussion about, about fixing it. But for many of my patients, the vast majority of patients I see in my office, it's not about surgery. It's about helping them with simpler things. And I, I have lots of patients I've seen through the years that have gotten away with, okay, we, they have a fairly bad knee, but they only need maybe an injection twice a year. Maybe wear a brace when they're being active. Maybe occasionally they take a little bit of Motrin or, or prescription type medication to help their discomfort. Um, and, and if we can manage them that way, there, there certainly is nothing wrong with that. Um, there are a lot of patients that do have somewhat of worn out knees, but they still can function very well and lead a very productive, active life without necessarily needing surgery. Um, some of my patients I talk to and they're understanding that, yeah, over time maybe they will need a knee replacement, but that'll happen when they struggle to the point where they're not enjoying life. Uh, so if we can keep them active and keep them going, that's usually how I tend to approach it with my patients. I'm sorry, one more person squeezed in a question. Well, it's good, it's good. <laughs> Tommy asked, if you have large bone spurs, is it beneficial to remove these for pain control? before doing total knee replacement? No, no, we don't do that. Uh, those bone spurs come off when patients get knee replacements. The reason the bone spurs have happened is because in most instances you've already lost all the cartilage in the knee. The knee is worn out, the knee will respond to that by making bone spurs. So the bone spurs are really a sign that you already have a worn out knee. Um, I always use car examples and I tell people, I don't know, that would kind of be like putting your car up on the lift to to, to change a couple bolts when in reality you have worn out tires and you really haven't solved the problem at that point. So um, it's funny you ask that because in reality that's a surgery that used to be done way back in the 1950s before knee replacement existed. Um, surgeons would take people to the operating room and trim off the bone spurs. But those patients never did well because in reality their problem was they had a worn out knee. The problem is at that time, knee replacement didn't really exist like it did today. And so these patients would end up going through these surgeries and in the end they really didn't do well. Um, and we, when, when you look back in history, we learn from those surgeons who did those god awful surgeries back in the day. We have better options now uh, to help that.
Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Telehowski. I do want to give a shout out to Dan. He says that he's having total knee replacement with Rosa here at Hurley in the next three weeks. So we hope that gives him a better quality of life. And if you want to improve your quality of life, head to HurleyMC.com. Thank you to MidMichigan Now for being our broadcast partners. Have a great day, everyone.